Hello everybody, this is James Doherty. It's great to be here with you again today. Today we're going to be focusing on an exciting subject, the proportions of the male figure. We're going to be using some basic drawing instruments, triangle, straight edge, pencil, and a parallel rule. The subject is very important when you're studying architecture. A lot of classic architecture uses the human figure in the form of sculpture um, or ornament. Also, the proportions of the human figure can be used to inform the proportions of the building itself. So beyond just classical architecture with figurative sculpture, the study of human proportions can, can help to inform many different styles of architecture. What we're going to be working from today is a great book called Figure Drawing for All It's Worth by Andrew Loomis, a classic drawing book. And in this book, he has a, a kind of a great series of studies of proportion of both the male and the female human figure. So for today, we're going to be focusing on the male figure. So he recommends actually starting in a, in a way that is quite similar to, for example, what uh, Vignola talks about when he's laying out uh, column proportions. You start with the overall height first. And what we're going to work on today is uh, what Andrew Loomis uh, uh, designates as proportions for what he calls the ideal male figure. Essentially, it's kind of a medium, a good medium set of proportions. Uh, it's a little bit like, again, Vignola's proportions for the column. In actual practice, there are many, many variations from this, but it's kind of a good kind of a uh, strong medium set of proportions. So what we're going to do, again similar to drawing columns, is start with a center line, a vertical center line. Here we're going to draw three center lines, uh, one for the front of the figure on the left, one for the side of the figure, and one for the rear of the figure. And so a first step, what we're going to do is divide this overall height into eight pieces. And each of those pieces is essentially going to represent one head height. So the height of a head is going to be our basic module that we're going we're gonna to use to subdivide our figure and establish its proportions. So what we're going to do in, to create that division of the height into eight parts, what we're going to do is take a, take a scale and lay it at a diagonal, a scale that has uh, eight even increments, and then mark each of those eight spots and then draw the lines across to our vertical center lines. So in that way we can subdivide over overall scale to eight pieces. What I'm going to do is create a little kind of a measuring tape for myself here with a piece of paper, a scrap piece of paper, so that I can measure widths, for example, also, in addition to, to heights. Now what Loomis talks about for the overall width of the male figure, the overall width is essentially uh, two and uh, two and one third head heights. So we're going to mark that two and one third width, two and one third head heights for the width for both the, the front and the back of the figure and then mark off those edges with vertical lines. So we essentially have these tall rectangles that are going to be the kind of bounding rectangles for the front and the rear of our figure. Let's extend those center lines up a little bit so we can differentiate between our center lines and those edge lines. And let's mark off each of those head heights on the figure, one through eight. So starting at the top, we're going to begin by laying in the head shape itself. So this will take our, our top module of our eight head heights. So we'll draw that from the front and the rear. The silhouette from the front and the rear is essentially identical. And then from the side, the, the back of the jaw and kind of the front of the ear essentially falls right on the center line. And then uh, the face falls forward of that. So this our basic head shape from the front side and rear. Now what we're going to do is, is mark a navel height that's basically at uh, five head heights off the ground. And then what we're going to do is come down one third of a head height <coughs> between the uh, uh, one, one third of a head height lower than the seventh mark there, and that's going to be the height of our shoulders. There's actually a, a one sixth of the overall height down from the top of the figure is where the shoulders essentially lie. So we'll draw in the shoulders, connect the shoulders to the head with the neck, and then begin to kind of ghost in the, the, the basic chest shape. The nipple line falls about on the sixth, sixth line there, the sixth head height right from the bottom. And the distance between the nipple points is basically one head height. And if you connect a line actually from the navel through the nipple line diagonally, up to the left and the right, 
Um, where that exits the top of the shoulder is another important marking spot on the figure in terms of marking proportions. That's the, the location of the acromion on either shoulder. That's basically the kind of a, there's a kind of a bony protuberance there on the top of the shoulder. And when someone is drawing, uh, drawing the figure, when an artist is drawing the figure or a sculptor is looking at the figure, those bon bony spots, the spot spots where the skeleton cl close to the surface of the figure, are spots that um, are useful for identifying proportions. You know, the muscles can flex and so forth, and so they, they uh, are changing form a lot, but those bony protuberances are quite useful to locate. Now, a third of a head height down from the navel, down from the, the navel, um, so basically a third of a head height down from the number five mark there, that's going to be the height of our hips. So we'll mark that in. And then the, the crotch comes down at essentially the halfway up the figure. So the, the, the fourth head height from the bottom is going to be the crotch line. And the, uh, the knees, we'll start to go to the knees in as well. The knees are basically going to be uh, just above the w one quarter up from the bottom of the figure. So two head heights up from the bottom of the figure, that's where the bottom of your knees will occur. And now drawing in the profile of the legs, the calves, and the kind of, kind of arcing shape of the calves as they lead down toward the foot. Now, An Andrew Loomis talks about uh, when studying these kind of early proportions for the figure, um, not to worry too much, not to worry too much about specific elements of anatomy, um, but mainly looking again at these, these overall markers. This uh, study of the overall proportions of the figure occurs close to the beginning of his book, Figure Drawing for All It's Worth. Um, so what he essentially wants to do is convey the overall subdivisions of the figure with the idea that there's going to be greater depth of study of specifics of anatomy, all, all the muscles and, and uh, bones that make up the skeleton and so forth as, as the study goes forward. So here we want to get a kind of a sense of the overall form. Now the wrists, the wrists tend to fall uh, right about halfway down the figure. So again, at that number four spot, the four head heights up from the bottom, that's where the, the wrists are going to occur and the hands will fall below that. So that's essentially it for the front of our figure. The back of the figure, again, will have a very similar silhouette and then the kind of the internal modeling of the figure is going to be a little bit different, of course. So the bottom of the shoulders, kind of where the shoulders curve in, the bottom of the deltoids is occurring uh, just about at that sixth head height from the bottom. The on the rear of the figure, the buttocks line is occurring uh, again a third of a, a third of a head height down from the the fourth head height from the bottom. So basically a third of the head height down from the center of the figure. The spots on the uh, inside, or the spots on the outside of the hips on both sides, you can see here kind of the widest spot of the hips. <coughs> that's another important kind of bony protuberance called the great trochanter. So that's another important spot to kind of look for. It's basically where the, where the uh, top of the femur is uh, there's kind of an indentation on the outer side of the hip on either side, and, and that uh, there's kind of a, a bony spot on the top of the femur that comes very close to the skin there. So again, drawing the silhouettes of the arms, wrists falling just below, midway up the figure. And the arc of the forearms, and then the hands kind of hanging down just below that, about the halfway point of the figure. And then ghosting in the silhouettes again of the legs, again similar to the front silhouette, the rear silhouette is essentially identical. And then adding in the ankles and feet.
Andrew Loomis's book was written in uh, 1944, um, and it's uh, quite interesting. He was actually writing it uh, as a textbook, as a guide to artists that might work in uh, magazine publications. There was a lot of kind of hand-done work creating ads for magazines, you know, doing front covers of magazines and illustrations for magazines and so forth. A lot of this work was being done by hand with drawing and painting at that point in time. It was before photography got to be nearly as prevalent as it is today. Um, so this knowledge of how to, how to indicate the human figure, how to draw the human figure in a, a variety of different kinds of poses and also in a variety of different kinds of costumes and dress with backgrounds and so forth was very important. So there's such a facility that was occurring at that time period in terms of drawing the human figure. It's actually a great period to look to for, for instruction. So we're lucky that Mr. Loomis wrote all this down in his series of books. Here, just adding a bit of detail on the, the anatomy. Marking the spots of the shoulder blades. Indicating the crest of the rib cage some of the muscles of the abdomen. Just enough to kind of give a, a sense of anatomy here. Again, we're not trying to get too specific with the design and, and drawing of the anatomy itself here, mainly just focusing on those overall proportions. So we've got the front of the figure and the rear of the figure now, now working on the side of the figure. So we're gonna have taken those, those major landmarks from the front and the rear, and we're gonna, going to extend those over to the side of our figure. So the top of the shoulder again, uh, right at uh, six and three quarter head heights from the bottom. I'm sorry, six and two-third head heights from the bottom. We'll see the, the nipple line again at uh, six head heights from the bottom, and then the bottom of the pectoral muscles just below that. In that spot of the, the pectorals and then the, the extension of the crest of the rib cage just below the pectorals. That's kind of the, the furthest extent um, of, of the abdomen. So we've got a vertical line that we've drawn down from there to kind of create a bit of a bounding box for ourselves. Now walking in the upper and lower abdomen. It's interesting as we begin to block in the legs, the center line of the figure from the side is, is uh, quite interesting. The, the center line is essentially with this, a line marking the center of gravity. And um, as you get to the lower legs, that center of gravity, uh, oftentimes, depending on the, the location of the legs, but if someone is just standing, that, uh, that center line will actually um, go forward of the shins. So the, the shin bone will actually, actually arc backward behind that line that marks the center of gravity and then the center gravity line will uh, extend through the feet. For most of, its, uh, most of its distance, that center of gravity line is actually within the body, so being held kind of vertically by the, by the skeleton. So it's interesting that the, the legs are actually kind of forming this S-curve in the lower half of the legs, or essentially behind that, that line of center of gravity. The elbows are falling at uh, just about five head heights from the bottom. And again, the wrist falling at uh, right about four head heights from the bottom, just below four head heights from the bottom. The wrists are just below halfway up the figure. And the hands extending down from there. Indicating some of the anatomy of the torso now, clarifying some of that basic anatomy. So now we're just about finished, just about finished with our overall indication of the anatomy and basic proportions. So we're going to just go through a bit of a process of kind of cleaning things up a little bit here. That's essentially it in a nutshell, though. 
So fairly straightforward. So the idea that Andrew Loomis has is to make these major landmarks to look for in the anatomy pretty straightforward. He wants to not create too many of them, not to have too many to focus on, but enough that you can really indicate the uh, the main structure and the main the main spots of the figure, so that you can create a, a kind of a kind of an overall skeletal framework that then you can go in and add further detail to. Um, one of the, his reasons for doing this, again, because a lot of his uh, writing was focused on this idea of ad work, um, the the people who were creating the illustrations and ads for these magazines oftentimes needed to create many different proposals, many different drawn proposals for uh, a given assignment with the idea that there might be an editor, for example, who needed to select between these different proposals to figure out which one to, to pursue for the, for the final version. Um, and so they needed to work actually quite quickly. They needed to block out their compositions very quickly and give a kind of a sense of, uh, of uh, you know, a convincing view for, for what each of these compositions might look like if they were fully realized but uh, again working under kind of extreme pressure of time. So this idea of being able to block out major proportions with the idea that um, once the, the major landmarks are in place things can get subdivided and refined over time as you're working toward the, the final version um, is, is really quite useful. It allows you to work quickly and to, to create kind of an overall sense of a composition. A lot of classic architectural treaties, you know, our study of anatomy and study of human, the human figure and drawing um, is uh, traditionally a, a very important part of the architectural study process. And the idea here is that the, the human form is a, a great example of uh, nature's solutions to structural problems. You know, the human body is designed for movement, designed uh, to, to lift weights and uh, to hold loads and to, to, to move in a whole variety of different ways. Um, and so it's actually a, you know, a beautiful mechanism for facil facilitating this kind of movement and, and, uh, and, and performing tasks and so forth. And so classic uh, architects thought it was very important to study the human figure because it gave a great sense for how nature would solve these, these structural challenges and structural tasks. And nature typically has a, a very beautiful way of solving structural challenges. So by studying the human figure, they looked at it as a great way to refine the eye um, so that uh, when an architect is designing a building, that uh, that same sense of proportions, that same kind of kind of feel of proportions, that uh, that one absorbed when studying the human figure could then be used in their own compositions. And again, in a lot of classic architecture, the human figure itself is actually represented in uh, sculpture and ornament. This kind of sense of the proportions of the human figure is useful for essentially any style of architecture as well. You know, if one is doing contemporary architecture that has very little ornament, contemporary architecture still is, is heavily dependent on very studied proportions. And so this idea of, of uh, having a sense of how one part proportionally relates to another and basing this on the way nature might solve a structural problem is very useful when informing even contemporary architecture. Now there's going through and clarifying some of those forms just a little bit more. There are a series of great diagrams in Andrew Loomis's books. And this is again, uh, essentially drawing directly from his diagram for the ideal male figure. Uh, it's worth going through and taking a look at that book if you get a chance. It's worth uh, getting a copy and looking at those different diagrams. The book gets into greater depth later on in terms of study of, of specifics of anatomy and how muscles connect to the bones and, and, and so forth, so it's really, really rigorous. Um, but uh, this book is a, a fantastic resource, especially this idea of studying basic proportions of the human figure. So I hope you found this enjoyable and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks a lot.